Welcome to the Executive Compensation Podcast. On this show, we discuss all aspects of executive compensation. Whether you're a compensation committee member, a seasoned compensation professional, or just curious to learn more about executive compensation, then this show is the answer. Each episode brings you a focused and actionable interview on specific topics of executive compensation. This episode is brought to you by Meridian Compensation Partners. Meridian works with compensation committees to ensure the most effective processes are in place to go beyond mere compliance with governance requirements and create healthy, dynamic relationships between the board, management, and its advisors. Meridian helps boards use compensation to attract and retain critical talent and to make informed business decisions that will link pay and performance, drive business results, increase shareholder value, and mitigate potential risks. Learn more at meridiancp.com. What I would like to start with is why don't you just give me an overview, summarize this whole topic into uh, one key takeaway if you can. Yeah, we live in tumultuous times and there's a fair bit of populism in almost every topic that's in our public discourse or commercial discourse for that matter. And populism, though, usually involve any political persuasion. I'm uh, not concerned about your particular point of view. It's usually rooted in emotion and in sentiment and not so much in facts and analysis. And so our purpose is pretty basic. Just simply bring some facts and analysis and basic understanding to executive pay. That's all. Okay, great. And also, I'm going to mute myself like I just did while you're speaking. So sure. it doesn't pick up any background noise that might be going on my end. Sure. Okay, so now let's dive into your outline that you sent over. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then let's move on. Why do executives get paid so much? Executives command a large price or a high price for the same reasons that other goods or services command a large price or a high price, whether it's certain kinds of real estate, uh, jewels, professional athletes, entertainers. It's the basic interaction of buyers and sellers, of supply and demand. Maybe a few examples might help. There's comparatively few people at any given moment in time that can do many of these senior executive jobs. How many people can perform well and credibly as the CEO of Apple, Microsoft, Google, Lockheed Martin, Abbott Laboratories, a myriad of other public companies or private companies for that matter. Secondly, there's unique skills that go into these roles. If you think about it, for any of these executive roles or a CEO or other executives, most of the time, these people don't take these roles until they're older than age 50. So they've been working for 25 years, honing their skills in a multitude of roles, financial, human, uh, technological, organizational, to have the skills to do these jobs in addition to their own academic training. So that's on the supply side. On the demand side, this is a competitive market for talent. There are 5,500 public companies in the U.S. alone, not to mention many multiples of that of private companies. And so there's a lot of demand for these people. There's a lot of value at stake. There's a lot of value to be had, a lot of benefits to be had by getting it right, having the right people, with the right skills at the right place at the right time. And likewise, there's a lot of costs and a lot of risks if you get it wrong. And we can all have seen examples of companies that get it wrong. The value of people, intellectual capital, but really the value of people, human skills has never been higher. And lastly, and related to that, there's few substitutes. Leadership requires people. You can't get a machine to, to be the head of human resources or a chief financial officer. You need people to do these roles. So it's this combination of the supply of this kind of talent and the demand for it that really raises the value of executive pay. Great. That all makes perfect sense. So is there then a ratcheting effect since companies tend to benchmark each other that simply, you know, tends to increase the pay? Yeah. yeah this is a what common if, like, argument. Here. Right. Sorry, I'll let you go ahead. No, so this is a common argument. We hear this a lot. And it's alluring, right? It's, it seems intuitive. But I think the cause and effect, for the most part, tends to be the other way around. A couple of examples. The multiple listing service for residential homes, the MLS system or price of gasoline when you drive by any station. The, they're both quoting prices, they're quoting values. I don't think those quotes drive up the value of homes or drive up the value of, of the price of gasoline. Those prices are reflecting other underlying realities, much more so than just simply I'm comparing myself to you or you to me or vice versa. Having said that, 
the increase in the volume of public information effectively has created a kind of an efficient market for executive talent. Whenever you make information readily available and essentially with almost no cost, you make the value of unique assets higher. People now know what the value of other opportunity other uh, people are making. And I think that's one of the unintended consequences. This is not a unique insight, by the way, but this is one of the unintended consequences of the expansive disclosure of proxies that started in the early 90s and then expanded again in the mid 2000s. We made information about executives all the more plentiful, readily available for people to make decisions. And I think effectively drove up the value of executive pay. Okay, so with that said, is it possible for executives to be overpaid? Yes, yes. You can overpay for executive talent just like you can overpay for anything. You can overpay for a product that didn't perform up to your expectations. You can overpay for a service that didn't meet your expectations. This is definitely possible and happens. You can underpay, but the the marketplace for talent is no different than any other marketplace. It does not guarantee an ideal outcome. It does not guarantee a perfect outcome. It just simply establishes a price. Whether to pay a certain amount or how to pay a certain amount is really where the art meets the science, where judgment meets data. So then tell me, Jamie, how do companies then keep from overpaying? What you're really talking about is how to pay. Uh, and what most companies undertake and these are common for almost every company you would encounter, certainly in a public company level, is to undertake several steps. First of all, understand the market you're competing in. To use the common language, what's the peer group? Which companies do we want to benchmark to understand this marketplace? How much do they pay for a similar role? And correspondingly, how do they pay them? They're not just simply, and this is a common misperception, that they're just providing just all base salary. That's clearly not the case. Most executives for CEO, for instance, more than 70% of their pay commonly will be performance-based. So it's not a gimme, it's not a layup. And that performance-based pay will be a mixture of short-term, things you wanna do in the near term, and long-term incentives. And the realized amount from that pay opportunity is not a sure thing, we'll find out over a course of time. Some will do very well, some won't. It's, there's a great variety of outcomes. And in teach, you know, if, you're, if you happen to be in the uh, retail industry or hospitality or transport, it's not a good time. There's not a lot of value being created. Correspondingly, there are other industries are doing much better and there is a lot of value being created. So there's a direct relationship between the structure of the pay and what comes out in the end. So a follow-up question to that. It sounds like we're maybe walking a fine line between when we benchmark against other companies and see what they're doing. I think there's a fine line between wanting to compete with them versus just using them as facts and data. So I guess how do you have any tips for how to walk that fine line and maybe not see benchmarking against other companies as competition and just as collecting data and facts. Now you're hitting on a great point. And we say frequently to clients, market data, like any sort of data, is a reference point to making a decision. The data shouldn't force you to make a decision. There's a variety of reasons you might decide to pay more or less to a particular incumbent. Say someone is relatively new, they've never had this role before. You think the world of them, you think they're very promising, but hey, they're gonna give you an opportunity for them to prove themselves. They might be less, lower in the market range. Likewise, you might have somebody else who's very seasoned. You recruit them from the outside. They were a CEO or a CFO someplace else. They're bringing in a lot of experience that you really need. You might pay more than the median or the, what is typical. That person is worth it to you. You might also pay more or less depending on how valuable the job is to you. How valuable is this role to us under the current facts and circumstances? If you've got financial troubles and you really need a, a financial expert, you're, it's worth it to you to pay more. So data is one fact. There are many others that, that play into this. And then what are some signs, Jamie, that you might be overpaying an executive or that you might be underpaying an executive? And I guess underpaying would be easier to spot because most likely the executive would come to you and complain about it, and then you would know. But yeah, some, can you just give some signs that you might spot that you're either overpaying or underpaying? Let's talk about the overpaying. Many companies, most companies would undertake analysis either annually or periodically to look at how much, are, how much pay are our executives realizing relative to other executives, let's say we compare ourselves to, what percentile ranking are they actually earning versus our competitors? 
And correspondingly, what's the relative rank of our performance? What sort of total shareholder return do we have? What sort of return on capital do we have? What sort of profit growth do we have? There should be some directional consistency, not perfect, but a directional consistency. If we're a top quartile payer, hopefully we've been a top quartile performer. And companies frequently look at this to make sure there's, we're maintaining that sort of directional consistency. Let's say there isn't. Well, that usually either tells us the pay opportunities are too high, our goals might be too low, or the performance measures we're using are maybe not the right ones. That's the information you take from that kind of analysis and you adapt your programs accordingly. The reverse can be true too. You might be performing terrifically and maybe there's not, maybe you are relatively low rank in pay, well, same outcome. Pay opportunities might be too low, Maybe the goals are more difficult than other companies are setting. This is an essential analysis to be done. Many companies do it already to be able to calibrate, are we maintaining the balance between pay and perform? Okay, great. Actually, I see that Ryan just hopped in. So I'm gonna let him in real quick. Hi, Ryan, sure, welcome. All right, I will keep going. I was Okay, so the next question then is, the way you phrase it, isn't there widespread dissatisfaction with executive compensation? Is this sort of a commonly held view or, yeah, like how do most people view executive compensation? If we view it from the from a shareholder point of view, no, there's not widespread dissatisfaction with executive compensation. If shareholder votes are any a strong indication, we know for the last 10 years, companies have had, held say on pay votes. And over that time, somewhere in the neighborhood of one to 2% of companies in any given year actually fail their say on pay vote. That is, fail to get majority support from their shareholders. And indeed, 80% of companies routinely get more than 90% support. So from the point of view of the shareholders, the people really involved in this transaction, if you like, there's actually widespread support. And where there is discontent among shareholders, usually it's less about the pay program, it can be that, and more about performance. But Really, most of the outcry, most of the noise we hear about executive pay tends to come from either the media or from politicians. And they come at the subject from a different angle and they're more than entitled. They can have a point of view, we understand that. But that's a more of a philosophical view and a social view that people can decide for themselves, but it's really not germane to whether or not is executive pay too high or too low. Shareholders are making that judgment. And I guess from the media's view or the public's view, what would they propose that executive pay, like would they propose that executive pay just doesn't exist altogether or would they just restructure no, it? I'm sure they wouldn't say it shouldn't exist. Of course, there's a great variety of publications and political figures to be sure. And some would be more dramatic than others. But if I can speak in just a sweeping generalities, for those that might advocate either more disclosure or more regulation or more limits or caps or various kinds of constraints, in the main, these things in the past have generally backfired. They have tended to make things worse, certainly more bureaucratic, more cumbersome. It is no evidence these things do much to actually reduce executive pay. And as I was saying before, I think the enhanced disclosure, you can make a very strong case, actually increased executive pay. It created an efficient market of information for executives. It didn't before that exist. So the best thing to do if, if a company is upset about executive pay, their shareholders, their board will fix it quick enough. If they feel like they're not getting a good deal, they're going to fix it. They're bearing the cost if such a circumstance exists and they're going to correct it. If they feel like they are getting a good deal, then obviously they're satisfied with the performance of the company and with their people. They're bearing the cost, they're reaping the benefits, and they're the people who have everything to gain by keeping it, keeping a good system, having it be balanced. Okay, great. All right. So what are some aspects of executive compensation that could be improved. Every economic decision ultimately revolves around two things. What are the costs and compared to what? What are the costs and compared to what? And companies make decisions on the totality of costs and benefits. Sometimes there are minor issues, sometimes there's huge issues. And when a company makes decisions even to pay severance, they don't do that casually. But really what they're deciding is, what's the cost of paying the severance versus the cost of not paying the severance? By assumption, if you're prepared to pay severance, you feel as though you need to make some material change in a particular role, whether it's the CEO or any other role. You're making a decision that something needs to be different. And you, you think that cost is less than the cost of continuing on the current path. The best way to limit those kinds of contingent costs, if you like, is really how you design the program up front. 
by the time you get to the event, it might be too late, but how you design the program up front. And again, most companies do this. What amount of severance would we pay if things don't go well? For what reasons? And likewise, what is gonna to happen to other forms of pay programs? For example, if you have unvested equity awards, what happens if we decide to part ways? Designing that up front, getting those terms and conditions up front will lessen or at least make those costs known in any particular circumstance. As I said, this is a marketplace like any others. It's prone to people making bad decisions. That's true, but that doesn't make it flawed. It just means it's a human institution and people adapt to the facts and circumstances. They learn from their mistakes. Okay. okay, great. You mentioned that the best way to prevent issues from happening is to design the right programs up front. So what are some tips that you would give for how to design a program up front in the right way so that you can avoid these issues down the line? This is a process most companies follow on a regular basis. There's a normal annual rhythm and rigor and regimen that they follow in managing and overseeing executive pay. So this is not a person by person event. So simple things as we talked about before, understanding the marketplace they decide they wanna compete in. What are their practices? What are their pay levels? What are the design of their programs? That's the first thing. And then how do we wanna structure our pay? How much do we want it to be performance based? What kind of performance? Do we want to A, reward for value creation, to simplify, just say, simply say stock price growth, or do we want to value for the things that drive value creation, profitability, growth, efficiency? And it's not mutually exclusive. Companies oftentimes decide to do a bit of both. But their structure of the arrangements are pretty disciplined. Again, these are not unique insights. This is meant to be a basic understanding for people who may not be fully steeped in the subject, or just relatively new to it. That kind of formality and rigor is very common for major companies, public and private. And that's the process they go about to make sure, hey, we're doing the right thing, that is balanced, that is performance oriented, but that's gonna allow us to get and keep the right people. So in terms of what actually goes into the executive compensation plan, whether it's focused on just financial metrics or whether it's focused on some more intangible metrics, do you have any recommendations as to what kind of mix to use there or based on what you've seen has have financial metrics worked better than more intangible like metrics you can't measure? And I guess I've always been interested in if you're, if you do want to focus on those more intangible metrics, then how do you go about measuring that? Yeah, for the most part, and these are for-profit organizations, right? And so they have some ultimate accountability to their shareholders, whether it be in shareholder values, I was talking about a moment ago, or in terms of profitability. And for the senior level executives, ultimately, you're paying for outcomes. Now, there may be all kinds of intangibles, all kinds of things that don't make it into the incentive plan that they know by way of their experience and expertise that are going to be pivotal to getting to those outcomes. And there may be all sorts of intangibles like that. They frequently don't make it to the incentive plan, but that doesn't make them unimportant. There's all kinds of things that companies do, you do, I do every day that are not in our incentive plans, but we know that are important to do for the organization, for our people, and for the ultimate outcomes. But for the incentive plans, they tend to be pretty familiar variety of high level financial criteria or shareholder value. It's return on capital, it's profitability, it's top line growth, it's stock price appreciation. These are very familiar criteria of ultimate success of a for-profit entity. But that doesn't dismiss these other things. They're just feeders into them ultimately. Yes, and what scenarios would the shareholder request that like more intangible measures go into it. In a previous article, we talked about ES and G measures, and I'm just thinking with those that that could benefit your company just from a PR perspective, and that has almost nothing to do with financials or anything like that. So, what are some like other aspects or other ways to grow the business using executive using these incentives that people might not be thinking about? Yes, and those kinds of measures are going to vary from industry to industry. You talked about ESG, certain industries that in a heavy industry or a public utility, which really have a substantial environmental footprint that's evident, you'll tend to see those measures, the environmental measures in particular, more prominent in their incentive plans. They can measure it. It actually does have a demonstrable cost on their business. And in fact, there's a lot of value to be had by controlling those. But even there, the weighting on those measures tend to be pretty 
pretty modest, tend to be in the 10, maybe 15% range in a short-term incentives, and you frequently don't even see them in the LTI. Could these things change over time? It's possible, it's possible, but that weighting is evident of probably the difficulty in measuring them, but it's also reflective of they're trying to convey a message to the outside world. Hey, these things matter to us, we're paying attention to them, and but they're not necessarily ideal incentive measures, either because they may have imperfections in how to measure them, they might be soft criteria, or you're careful about putting too much measurement to too much math to something that might inherently be measuring your values, which are important, but it may not be something that lends itself to a good incentive measure. Got it. Okay, great. So now let's let's think ahead. Where is executive compensation heading in the future? The first thing, again, I want to reemphasize is that executive compensation is high because of the value of people, the value of talented people to help organizations, complex organizations succeed. Things don't just happen. They happen because people dedicate themselves. That's the first thing. The second is that the preponderant amount of value that people ultimately realize is a function of value creation. Change in the value of their underlying company's share price and the improvement in their profitability. If companies continue to create value, then they'll continue to realize more. These seem almost self-evident, but uh, it's important principles. And it's also not consistent though. Not every company is going to be successful. Not every company is successful at the same time. We're experiencing it right now. So there's a great variety of outcomes. And that's because these programs are usually structured with a fair amount of performance-based pay. And performance is not good. But realized pay is also not going to be good. It would be that for good or ill, it's still going to be a controversial subject. This is still a subject that people like to read about and get engaged with and but mostly it's going to be a source of controversy for people who are uninvited guests to, or to the subject politicians media again they're more than they have they're, they have the right to participate and respect in a different point of view but they're, they have a different vantage point on the subject but it's, it's a part of a reality and as i already said for those who are inclined to put one or another more limits or disclosure or other kinds of regulatory apparatus, these things almost invariably seem to backfire. It makes things more expensive and frequently leads to unintended outcomes of higher executive pay or less performance-based pay or both. A better path is to simply let companies work it out. If they've got a bad program, they're going to learn quick enough. Okay, great. So I want to go back and play devil's advocate a little bit and try to draw out sure. some of the other side and that way we can strengthen your side as well. But so okay. going back to where we started, which is just why do executives get paid so much? And you said it's a basic supply and demand thing. These people are highly skilled and most of them have worked for 20, 30 years to get there. How would you respond to the argument then that a lot of these people just ride their way up in the high chain of hierarchy at a company based on factors other than their skill and actual contribution. I don't think that's true. And I don't think that it really defies logic. If you're talking about a big organization, no one just kind of rides their way to the top. Why wouldn't everybody ride their way to the top? For large competitive organizations, there are some people who have that aspiration and there's some people that don't. Some people have the skill sets and some that don't. Some that stay with the company and some that move on to something else. So to make it to the senior most levels in these roles, there's a lot of competition that goes on both internal and external to the company for that to happen. Indeed, people might make it to the top of a particular organization and they didn't ride the way through the top. They came from someplace else. Companies choose people based upon who can do the job most effectively and that requires skill and requires demonstrating results. So it doesn't just happen. Okay, and then on the flip side, I, I don't know if this is true, but it seems that there are more and more younger executives, younger people rising through the ranks quickly. And the argument, is there any controversy within the executive compensation world of people saying all these young people are rising up, they don't have the experience that they need or whatever the case may be? You know, is there any controversy there? There's no controversy there. Each company would make the judgment. If someone were relatively young for a particular role versus the norm, but if they were capable and skilled and impressed their, the people who were going to put them in the job, they would get the job. I think as a practical matter, for many larger companies, it's just a difficult 
thing to do to get to be fill in the blank role head of human resources by the time you're 32. It's just hard to accumulate the range of experiences and judgment to be able to do that. If you can, fantastic. Now for smaller companies, the classic startup variety, yes, I could see your point. There'd be a younger cadre of people. This is possible. They might've been in on the ground floor and establishing the company in the first place, or just simply that that's a part of the competitive landscape for that company. But there too, there's going to be pretty typically, even if they're younger, doesn't mean they're young in the absolute sense. Okay. So maybe the CEO is 42. That still means they've been working for 20 years. And then is there any, I'm sure this has appeared in the media and politicians have talked about it and things like that. But when you look at the demographic of executives in the big companies, do you find that the demographic makeup of that group is pretty limited and not very diverse? And are there any measures being taken by companies or by shareholders or by whoever in this world to encourage more diversity? They're very attentive to this topic, for sure. Companies are very attentive to this topic. Uh, They're very attentive to the fact they better make sure that the criteria that they're using to evaluate people is based on their merits and their potential and not anything other than that. But companies are very attentive to make sure that, hey, what are we doing that's best for the business here? And they're attracting a full slate of people that could be capable of doing the role, whether it be internal, if you're tended to develop people internally, or whether it be an external candidate. Those are very attentive to this, they're very careful. Yeah, can you name off some of the criteria that are commonly used to evaluate these executives? Ultimately is, can the person do the role? What evidence do we have for that? What experience have they had to demonstrate that they're going to be a good division president or a good chief financial officer? So do they have the resume to back it up? And can they speak to it and speak to the specific experiences in some of those roles? Can they articulate what the vision would be if they were in the role? What is it that you would do? How is it you would fulfill the responsibilities of the role for that particular company? So the meat and potatoes of whether or not somebody gets a job, especially if for a senior level executive job, is, is pretty evident. Have you demonstrated you can do the job and you can you instill the confidence that you can carry those experiences forward? Makes perfect sense. Okay. Just so you know, Diane, that's this is tangential what Brian and I do. We don't get much into the recruiting or the evaluation. Right. So this is, uh, we're uninvited guests and observers. <laughs> that was just a side question, more out of my own curiosity since you brought it up. Um, earlier. It's, uh, again, this is, we sit through committee meetings. They're, they're very attentive to how is it that we evaluate the totality of people's skills, right? And if we had old bad habits, let's leave those old bad habits at the door and make sure we're evaluating a full slate of people based on their. Thank you for listening. And we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Executive Compensation Podcast. You can see more about this episode along with additional executive compensation insights at meridiancp.com. That's meridian, the letter C and the letter P.com. This episode is brought to you by Meridian Compensation Partners. Meridian works with compensation committees to ensure the most effective processes are in place to go beyond mere compliance with governance requirements and create healthy dynamic relationships between the board, management, and its advisors. Meridian helps boards use compensation to attract and retain critical talent and to make informed business decisions that will link pay and performance, drive business results, increase shareholder value, and mitigate potential risks. Learn more at meridiancp.com.